Welcome to Corporate Competitor Podcast. The premise of the show is to learn how sports shaped today's business icons. I've sat down with some incredible executives, Top Golf CEO Dolph Burley, who ran track at Harvard, Chevron's Kim McHugh, who played volleyball at Texas A&M, and, and Sequoia Capital partner Carl Eschenbach, who was the captain of three varsity sports. But for this special edition episode, we want to tell the story of how sports helped change society. This is the 50th anniversary of a game that many would argue completely changed college football. In this bonus episode, I will start by telling you the story as it was chronicled in my book, Turning of the Tide, which came out several years ago. Then three of the players who were in the stadium that night join the show to reflect on the game and its enormous implications and get excited. My colleagues at ESPN will continue celebrating with the college game day feature. I'm Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. Well, there's still work to do, but that game showed the people in the stands that black and white players could get along and play and be pretty good. You know, it came down to, to more of the color of the uniforms as opposed to the color of the skin. The year was 1970. And despite the fact that Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier in baseball 23 years earlier, there wasn't a single black player on the varsity roster of the University of Alabama football team. Legendary coach Paul Bear Bryant had an open slot on his team's fall schedule. And while most would have used this opportunity to pursue a small local school that might serve as an easy win and a big payday, Bear flew across the country to invite coach John McKay and his University of Southern California Trojans, who had gone 10-0-1 the previous year, to come to Birmingham and play his Crimson Tide. Both teams had young talent, but Southern Cal had long before made the decision to embrace integration and allow black players to contribute to the on the field success of the team. In fact, by 1970, USC already had two black Heisman Trophy winners. Bryant wanted to integrate his team, but politics and pressure had prevented such a move. The genius of Bear Bryant deciding to play USC meant that the Alabama faithful would be given a first-hand view of how an integrated squad could look on the football field. I sat down with USC linebacker John Papadakis to understand the Trojans' perspective after Coach McKay told them at spring practice that the first game in the fall, they would be headed to Alabama. Well, it was a national conception at that time that going south was a dangerous thing. They hadn't accepted diversity as, as we know it anyway now. We had many African-American players on our team who felt a great deal of trepidation going into an area where they were not accepted as equals. The thing that's great about USC at the time is the coaches were wise enough to combine all the different colors, black, brown, white, into one of cardinal and gold, our team colors. We sacrificed our own private feelings, be they prejudiced or not, for uh, to create a team. And that's exactly what Alabama needed. They needed to see a team that was racially mixed functioning well. They needed to see black and white players hugging each other and creating sweat, something that was unfathomable to them at that time. It was a custom for Bear Bryant and coaches in the South to run off players at that time because they, had, they didn't have the character to play four quarters. If they hit them hard enough, they quit. Well, that's the lie that they used about the black people. Uh, they said that they weren't tough enough you know, to play four quarters, not like our white boys. Uh, the, the gentry class of white boys who have the character and will fight and you know, have courage. 
Well, Sam ran, Sam Cunningham that night in Alabama ran over by and through them like they were white ghosts. So that lie was forever dispelled. And they ended up feeling and thinking and saying, we need some of them Sam Cunninghams on our side. Remember, Don, that USC had already had two black Heisman Trophy winners in the 60s, Mike Garrett and O.J. Simpson. We weren't in need of a hero. Alabama needed a hero. And Sam Cunningham became that hero that evening. He became a symbol and an agent for change in the South. John is right. USC fullback Sam Cunningham was the breakout star of the game. USC beat Alabama 42 to 21, and all six touchdowns scored by the Trojans were registered by black players. Now, it was Sam's first college game, and he ended with 12 carries for 135 yards and two touchdowns. His dominant performance was the feather in the cap that Coach Bryant needed to convince the fan base and the higher-ups that the university should actively recruit and play black players on the football team. Recently, I sat down with Sam Cunningham to reflect on his big game back on September 12, 1970. I asked him to take me back to when the team first landed in Birmingham. It was interesting because being a youngster on that team, you know, a young guy, I kind of was watching the other guys. It really was, you know, my first game, my first road trip. So I was kind of like trying to figure out how to become one and how to act like one and how to be one. And, and, and that in itself was a challenge. You know, I didn't grow up in the deep South. I didn't grow up in, in South Central LA. I grew up in Santa Barbara. So, so the way I looked at things was a lot different than other people, but I also understood what was going on in that time of civil rights. On the way there, uh, or even back in LA, was there any discussion about the potential societal um, implications of, of the game? And this idea that you guys were, I mean, were you aware that you were the first fully integrated team to come into Alabama and, and face the Crimson Tide? I wasn't aware, no, because the coaches never really dwelled on that. They just dwelled on it as a football game against a really great program uh, that we were going to their house, you know. So it really, they didn't sit up and say, well, you know, the implications of this game is blah, 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 blah. They didn't do that. You just go play. I mean, for me, the, the less complicated it is, the better I, the better I deal with it. So I, and I believe Coach McKay and his, and his staff understood that to a certain extent, knowing that we were an integrated team going to a place where there were no blacks on the team. They didn't want to stoke the fires any more than, than, than it already has was, I should say. I knew it was a big football game, but I had no idea that, I mean, every football game you play, there, there, are, there are changes. But this one was like <laughs> over the top change, you know what I mean? Because it had never been played before. Yeah. And so that, that you know, and that's why 50 years, it, it's still such a big game and, and because it, it had such a real uh, important mark on college football history and, and, and civil rights history to a certain extent. Yeah. We talked to you for a couple seconds about the game. You know, they turned and, and they told you to get in there and next play you're, you're rambling for 12 yards and, and, uh, and, and then 16 a couple of plays later, and it happened for you quickly. I mean, I hadn't felt I was going to play that much because Charlie Evans, our starter, was a senior, and he was a really good fullback. The weird thing about that whole football game is that fullbacks at USC never really carried a ball. Right, you're half, you're half back you, baby. <laughs> That's right. Never really carried the ball. And Charlie and I and uh, Bill Hollett, that evening got an opportunity to, to touch the ball a little more than we normally do. And for me, it was only, I wanted to play as well as I could so I could play the next week. Right. It didn't have anything to do with, <laughs> with changing history or nothing. Cause you know, we, you know, it's a week by week thing when you play football, you know, especially when you, you're allowed to compete with each other. Yeah. yeah. How over time have you grown to appreciate what that night meant? I've grown 
to really understand how much it meant to the people. It was it was interesting to uh, to be a part of something, you know, African Americans to have the ability to 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 go where they wanted to go. You know, in high school, I got a, a recruiting letter from the University of Alabama, but you know, not that I couldn't have handled the physical part of it. It probably would have been the social and emotional part of it would have been a little bit much, you know, for me be having the freedoms or the, or the just the freedoms and foundation to just to be who I am in Santa Barbara and, and not being able to be that there, you know what I mean? So, right. Yeah. You actually had an interaction with Bear Bryant after the game uh, and, you know, he came over and we, uh, again, you played, you played three more years of college football. Did you ever see the opposing coach in your locker room again? No, not really. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often if it happens at all. You know what I mean? It, yeah. You know, to request to speak with a player or, or speak to the team for that matter. You know what I mean? So yeah. he, you know, he, can, he, you know, he just wanted to say thank you. He, and, he, and it wasn't just me. He said thank you to Jimmy Jones because Jimmy Jones was a starting black quarterback that evening. You know, and how rare is that? Right. I mean, that's. In 1970. Yeah, that's another story unto itself right there. So, so he. You know, he thanked, you know, them and myself and, and, you know, I mean, you know, Bear is probably an old poker player, so I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, he had a twinkle in his eye and, and whatnot, but, but it was, it was, it was a game of change that is still being felt today. And, and here we are 50 years out and, you know, a lot of us are weeble wobbling around, but we still <laughs> weren't and, and, uh, you know, it was a special night. And, you know, it came down to to more of the color of the uniforms as opposed to the color of the skin. And I'm just so thankful to be a part of it, you know, because that's what you're there for. You know, the good Lord put you in the spot to do something, you know, and, and you know, we will always be remembered for that and we will always be a part of college football history. And you've talked to people who have who've witnessed it and saw it and, and heard the whispers of how people talk about it. And it's and it was a pretty amazing football game. I don't think there's any other football game like it. And, I, and, you know, when I mentor kids, I tell them, I said, you never know when you do something, how much that little something that you do will help you, will help your family or your, your society or your neighborhood or whatever, whatever. You never know how much and, and when it will happen. But over time, it grows, you know. And, that, and just that night in Birmingham was just a drop. And now 50 years later, it's just, it, it feels like it was a tidal wave that, that that came through and washed up everything, but it was just a drop in the bucket. And over time, it has changed a lot of stuff and and given people the strength to. I mean, I mean, these young kids today don't even think about. It. They're mad because Alabama didn't didn't recruit, <laughs> you know, or or LSU didn't want nothing to do with them. You know, they're they're upset because of that. No, it was a time when they really didn't want you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Yeah. As time went on, the evidence of his impact was clear. Let me tell you a quick story from my book, Turning of the Tide, as it was told to me years ago. See, one player shared with me that while he was working as a tutor in Memphis, he went to the home of a black student that he was working with. He saw something there that took him by surprise. There were three pictures hanging on the wall of this home. One was of John F. Kennedy. The second was Martin Luther King. And the third, it was Sam Cunningham. In the Deep South, USC's victory was shared by many more people than those who were on the field. But Sam, Sam doesn't take the credit. My respect for Wilbur and John and, you know, there's many, many more that came after. They're truly the ones who actually did the work, the heavy lifting. You know, we we flew in, we played, I had a great game, we left, we gone. Okay, you know what I mean? Those young men who decided to go there and be a part of that program are the ones that, that in my mind, should receive the lion's share of the credit because they were the, the torchbearers of the deal, you know. I mean, we came in as an integrated team and 
and and and played like we normally played and and left up out of there and and there therefore the doors open now do what you guys are going to do and they did and, and nothing had really changed per se except that they were allowed to be a part of those programs the people understood that if we want to stay competitive if we want to be who we have been for so long we need to allow these black these young black men to come in and help us and that in itself they did now did that really changed how they looked at, at, at black folks? No. But the thing is, is that when Coach Bryant went to recruit these black players, he had to promise each and every one of his family that he was gonna personally take care of them and watch mm -hmm. out for them and, and, and make sure nothing happened to them. And that in itself is a whole story on its own. To tell that story, we have former Alabama running back Wilbur Jackson joining the show. Wilbur was Bear Bryant's first black scholarship player to be recruited out of high school, but his experience at Alabama was not new because just before his senior year of high school, Wilbur's all-black school had been closed and he was part of the integration of a nearby school that had previously been all white. Gosh, the high school was easy because unlike Bama, uh, my entire class went over. It was guys that I had known from the first grade that we had been together for 11 years. So, so, um, and, uh, so it was a small town. So it was really pretty, it, it was almost seamless really. Uh, we all went for spring training my junior year. And then we go back for our senior in the fall of my senior year, and all the guys that was at D.A. Smith, the all black school, they were there with me. So, so it was uh, it was pretty seamless. And and you went back and forth. You were a running back a, a, as a junior, became a wide receiver part way through, and then played wide receiver as a senior. And that's what you were recruited to Alabama to play, correct? Correct. And then you went up there for a recruiting visit, and um, and during that visit. Um, you actually got some one-on-one -on -one time with Coach Bryant. Yes, I did. He promised you certain things, not playing time, but he promised that you were going to be treated as a as a man at Alabama and that he would make sure of it. Exactly. Uh, you know, the night that we talked at his house, all the recruits were there, and we went over to a side room, and he said, look, if you come here, um, you know, uh, you ever have a problem, you know, don't go to anyone else. Come and see me, and uh, and, and we'll we'll work it out. Was there ever a situation when you felt you had to go to Coach Bryant? Only time, one time, uh, my senior year, uh, one Monday morning, my sister called. It was about six thirty, and um, she called. My mother had a stroke, mm -hmm. so I get up and I go straight to the athletic offices and. Coach Bryant wasn't in yet. Coach Griska, the freshman coach, mm -hmm. was there. And he asked me what was going on. I said, I need to go home. And he asked me, why? I said, my mother's sick. She had a stroke this Saturday night, you know. So, and he said, let me call coach. And he got on the phone, called Coach Bryant. Coach Bryant comes on to the phone and he, well, but what's going on? And I tell him what I just told you. And he said, well, look, uh, let me get a state car. Mm. Uh, drive you home and I said no coach uh, uh, I don't know how long I'm going to be there I got a car I had a Volkswagen you know and you know gas was 25 cents and I had a Volkswagen so <laughs> things were good you know so and I said no and he tried to talk me into you know a line a line on a state car to drive me home he, he said you sound like you upset let us do this for you. And I said, Coach, I'll be fine. I promise you, I'll be fine. But that was the only time during the time that I was there that I felt that I needed to go and talk to him about issues that I was having in the dorm or on the field or whatever. You know, so. There were 72,175 people that filled the seats at Legion Field to watch USC play Alabama. And one of them was Wilbur Jackson. You see, it wasn't until 1972 
that the NCAA allowed freshmen to play. So Wilbur watched the game unfold with largely all white people sitting around him. Think about this. He is sitting there watching his team, Alabama, compete against an integrated team. Quite the mixed emotions. I asked him who he was cheering for. There was a sense of pride seeing Southern Cal run on the field. And you see maybe half the team, 40% of the team, as being African Americans. So there was a sense of pride there. I'm also a homer. I was sitting <laughs> there. And I had, uh, you know, we had practiced two or three weeks. And all the guys on the varsity, you know, I didn't know them all by name, but there were a lot of guys on the varsity that I knew because they were from this area, Ozark, Dothan, Troy, lived in the same dormitory, ate in the same cafeteria. You know, you have to pull for, you know, your team, and that was Bama. But there was a sense of pride looking at looking across the field at uh, Southern Cal. At the end of the game, the two coaches met and shook hands. Bear Bryant had a big smile on his face. Thank you, he said to John McKay. Quite the unexpected response from a coach who had just lost such a big game. For years, the photo that captured the moment was hanging front and center in Coach McKay's den. You know, as time goes on, you learn a lot. When Coach Dye came to recruit me, you know, he talked to my mom and my dad. My dad worked on the railroad, worked on the railroad for 45 years. Wow. He put my, both of my sisters through college. One was a senior, one was a freshman. There was no scholarships at that time that we knew of. It was just all my dad's sweat. And I'll never forget that, you know. And I just remember talking to my mother one day, and she was talking about how tough my dad was having it, you know. I knew that we didn't have the best of everything, but we always had everything that we needed. And so a full ride to Alabama was a big deal in your house. Yeah, yeah. So so I always figured I could, you know, there were guys getting scholarships at that particular time. So I said, okay, well, I'm good enough to get a scholarship, I think. Wow. So, so you said that high school was a breeze um, going through the integration but college had to be just tougher. I mean, what was the roughest part of that for you? Oh, gosh, uh, you know, I think the toughest part was just the um, magnitude of the work. Practice sessions were just really, really tough, you know. And in high school, it was just a breeze, you know. Coach McClendon would come to me on Fridays in the hallway and say, look, I want four touchdowns tonight, you know. <laughs> it was like... No pressure. No problem, you know, Coach. No pressure. Just give me the ball, we'll do it, you know. And, and that's how it went, you know. Even the practices were just fun. But then you get to the university, everybody is good or better than you are, and or I was, and, and it was uh, it, it was tough. There, was some t there were some tough days. You know, there were a couple of days when, you know, I thought about leaving. Yeah. And that was more, but that was more about the game, the competition, the play. It was not about the race, right? The race, did the race issue become a challenge for you at all during that, during that four-year run? You know, I, looking back at it, I can't see, you know, I think I got every chance that was there. Right. But, um, you know, I look back at my dad and 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 what he went through. Mm -hmm. Work on the railroad all day, come home, his shirt would be white, lines of salt on his shirt. And I asked him what was that? And he said it's salt. And I like the only salt that I knew was the salt that would be on your kitchen table until later on. I, as I get older I, I, I find that out, you know, but what we talked about earlier about almost leaving. And when I look back at it, you know, it would, it would have been hard to leave. Uh, if, if I had left, I have to see how hard my dad had worked and what he had done for my two sisters and, 
And for the rest of us, you know, that would have been that would have been a letdown for for me. As you left ahead to uh, Alabama, knowing full well what was ahead, right? I mean, you know, Coach Brian had talked to you about. It. Did your parents give you any advice? <sighs> they just, I, you know, I know they were worried, but I was sitting for, in a, for your physical safety. Just worried that I was moving home. I was the youngest in the family, and uh, and then of course probably going there too to the university and. And I think as far as my mom and dad, especially my mother, you know, she always was gonna worry. She worried about me. Um, yeah, I think back to when, um, after my mom passed, I was talking to my dad one day and I asked her, asked, I asked my dad, what did mama say to him some night? And he said, look out for the kids. And we were all grown, full grown. You know, and uh, but her thoughts were to look out for the kids. That was a charge to my dad, you know, to look out for the kids. And so I know they were worried about me in that sense, you know, and I think there were a lot of guys that thought that the black athletes weren't going to be able to come in there and suck it up and stay because it was tough. It was very demanding. Coach Bryant was demanding, the coaches were demanding. And uh, and um, so I think we kind of debunked some theories there. But I think probably the best thing, the most important thing to me, and I think all of the guys is that over that four year span, you know, we also changed some hearts as well because my senior year, you know, the team would vote for the team, the permanent team captain. And I was voted the permanent offensive team captain. We debunked the theory that, you know, we weren't tough enough to take it. But the best thing is that, you know, we changed hearts as well. Yeah. First black captain, right? Yeah, because there were only like maybe nine guys of color that were eligible to vote. Right. So, so you got, the team was still, you know, predominantly, more than predominantly white. And still, you avoided the team captain, you know, the permanent captain. So, so in one uh, in one picture, you've got your father laying there, worrying about how I don't know how I'm going to make it. And then football gives you this chance. You get drafted in the first round, coming out of college, you get to go to San Francisco. Um, ultimately, get to get to win a Super Bowl and uh, play a nice career. So two last two questions. You're, uh, you're in Washington. Joe Gibbs comes to you and indicates that Bear Bryant had passed. Yes. Yes. Well, how do you, how do you feel in that moment? Do you remember how you, what was your emotional uh, um, condition as you thought about what Bryant did and 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 your relationship to him yeah it was tough because you know um coach bryant changed a lot of things not just at alabama but the entire state and i think back to that day um we were getting getting ready for the super bowl and coach gibbs come to me he said look well, there are going to be a lot of reporters at your locker when you get in and then he tell me that Coach Bryant just passed. And that was just like, you know, somebody had taken a rug and put it from underneath you. And, and then later on, you thought to think, you know, about all the things that Coach Bryant didn't just coach you football. He coached you about life as well. And I remember him, I remember he would say things like, Three things, don't do anything to embarrass your mom and your dad. Don't do anything to embarrass this university and don't do anything to embarrass yourself. He didn't just teach football, you know, he taught, he taught life as well. So now that you've heard the story, you might wonder, where are they now? Wilbur had an eight-year career in the NFL after college 
with the San Francisco 49ers and the Washington Redskins. In Washington, he became a Super Bowl champion. After his time in the NFL, Wilbur owned three-star cleaning service for 30 years, and today he lives in Ozark, Alabama. As for USC linebacker John Papadakis, he found new passions outside of football, including a nearly 40-year run owning the Papadakis Taverna in Southern California. Today, he is retired from the restaurant, but loves singing and performing for audiences. Sam Bam Cunningham was drafted by the New England Patriots. After his ninth NFL season, Sam started his own landscaping company called ANT Landscaping in the Los Angeles area. By 1979, Alabama had gone from zero black players to 18 on the roster and had won three national championships during the decade. Bear Bryant's genius was in recognizing the significance of the moment and taking advantage of it. The amazing uniting power of sports began changing and healing centuries old cultural divisions. Sports still does so today. From childhood, we are reminded that it's only a game. But sometimes history, experience, wisdom, or even innocence can show us that it's anything but just a game. It's a future. September 12, 1970 is the perfect example. On behalf of my entire team, thank you for listening to this special edition. Let's stay connected. Follow me on social media at Don Yeager and visit our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to subscribe to the show. Until next time, I appreciate you.